Hello and welcome to the Eclipsing History Podcast, a podcast where we explore the social, cultural, and political significance of eclipses through the diverse cultures of North America. This is another bonus episode titled Eclipses and the Development of Astronomy in Canada. Early on our project, we interviewed Randall Rosenfeld from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. You will notice that midway we had to switch to a phone line. The death of Randall's answers will overcome any loss in audio quality. We hope you enjoy it. The interviewer of this episode was Sam Davis. Um, so to begin, could you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, my name is Randall Rosenfeld. Um, I'm an old white guy and I do the history of astronomy. I'm the archivist for the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and for the uh, uh, CASCA, which is the Professional Association of Astronomers in Canada. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the history of astronomy. Have eclipses mattered in the history of astronomy? And then maybe you could speak to um, in Canada specifically as well. Sure. Um, they've mattered very much. And of, of course, the way they, they've they mattered uh, varies over time, you know, I, as you'd expect. Um, give you a few examples. I'm not going to start with Canada. Um, and one reason for not starting with Canada is if, if you're looking at a particular discipline, we're looking at uh, astronomy, it inherits the cultural stuff that went before it. And that could happen anywhere, which is sort of cool. And astronomers often, they look to where the earliest records and theories survive. And for the Western tradition, they often look to, to places like Babylonia or Greece. So I'll give you one example. Um, an eclipse was great because you've got this really dramatic observation and you've got to explain it. So if you have a theory and it doesn't agree with the observation, that's a sign that you've got to improve your theory. And that's how eclipses were sometimes used. One example, the second century BC, Hipparchus, very important uh, astronomer, um, he spent a lot of effort to improve his models uh, of eclipses and compare them to observations. And he came up with some really cool advances in mathematical techniques mostly to do with trigonometry. And some uh, scholars think that he developed those in order to respond to the eclipse observations he had and improve, and improve his uh, predictions of when these would happen. People could put a lot of effort, a lot of intellectual effort, a lot of time with uh, parchment or, or wax tablets and, and, and writing tools in compiling tables of eclipse predictions. Um, one example that comes to mind, there was this uh, guy, he didn't live very long, but he was sort of a uh, mid to late, mid to later uh, 15th century. His name was Reggio Montanus. Um, and one of his most famous books was a collection of uh, planetary tables, including eclipses. And he, it's reported that he spent a lot of time trying to get that right. And th th those were quite popular. Um, there's a story that Columbus, um, who is no longer such a cultural hero, and that's probably a good thing, but that uh, Columbus was armed with those when he came to the New World. Uh, as for North America, uh, eclipses were important in various ways. Um, a lot of the astronomy that was, that was practiced here, so in, in, in places that became Mexico, the United States, and Canada, a lot of that astronomy was very practical. It was orientated to uh, really quite utilitarian ends. Um, often allied to cartography. So you would determine your place on the Earth through astronomical observations. Um, so latitude and longitude. Latitude was a lot easier to determine. You just basically um, find out where the pole star is from your location. And you guys go out and do this, uh, you know, tonight if it was clear. It's just really quite easy. With a protractor, if you wanted. Longitude was a lot more difficult. But if you had an accurate table of eclipse predictions, you had and you had a decent telescope and a better clock, then you were perfectly set up 
through observing eclipses to find your longitude. And this was seen as important at the time as uh, as um, European settlers carved up the uh, the lands they met. Um, and we know about some of the consequences of, the, of that now. They usually use lunar eclipses, but they could use solar eclipses. The reason why they mostly use lunar eclipses is just that they were more frequent. As I mentioned earlier, so astronomy changes. Um, so the way it's used in, our, in the various countries we're in also changes. So one of the interesting uses of solar eclipses happened with the rise of astrophysics in the 19th century. And you had observers then paying a lot more attention to the possible physical constitution of the sun, uh, how it was, how how energy was generated, what it was made of, things like that. Well, there were really dramatic phenomena that you could only see because they were only visible during an during an eclipse. So when we look at the sun now, it's uh, you know, outside an eclipse. We're looking, we're looking at the photosphere. Um, but there are other layers of the sun, which when that's blotted out um, by the moon being there, you can see these other layers, which normally are, are too, um, um, too faint to be seen because they're drowned out by the other uh, light. So one is a chromosphere, and you get these prominences, and these are uh, best way to think of them. Um, they're um, um, gas, which is just sh sort of shot out from, from the surface of the sun. It appears very red to us, and they can see those prominences off the limb of the sun, and that's really cool. The other thing they can see is a corona, and that's the outer layer of the sun. And that you've got these coronal streamers. They're these ethereal glowing um, rays of, uh, of gas again. They're incredibly hot, though they didn't know that at the time. You've got, this, you've got these incredible phenomena. You can see them during an eclipse. But that means that a, a, a total eclipse is only going to last between 10 seconds and maybe seven and a half minutes. So they've, you know, the people doing the observing, they've got to work fast. At the end of that, when the eclipse is over, those phenomena disappear. Well, they don't actually disappear, but they disappear from sight because the uh, normal sunlight, the surface of the sun th that we can normally see, overwhelms those other layers. So eclipses became really important for that, and a lot of places um, sent out scientific. A lot of places in Europe, for instance, sent out scientific expeditions to North America to take advantage of. A, Solar eclipse. So in that way, they were important for, for the rise of astrophysics. In regard to Canada, um, I guess there's three things that jump to mind. So one is what I describe as, a, as an instance of pure luck for the observer. Um, so this is just after the Second World War. There's a, a chap named Arthur Covington. He was one of the pioneers in, uh, in radio astronomy, particularly radio astronomy um, directed towards observing the sun. He built his telescopes, so these are radio antennas. He built these from surplus war, war parts. Uh, this would be in 1945, 1946. And his dish was only about four feet across. And you think of the size of radio telescopes now. That's, you know, that's nothing. That's almost you know, something you put in your, in your knapsack nearly. Um, he'd originally wanted to observe cosmic noise, so radio waves, from the Milky Way. He tried that. His dish wasn't sensitive enough. It wasn't big enough. He got nothing. But it was big enough to get the signals from the sun. But his problem was he didn't have good resolution. But he could tell... What he could tell, he could detect signals, but he couldn't tell where on the surface of the sun these things were coming from. But the solar eclipse, the luck of a solar eclipse, enabled him to get really good resolution. So what, and the way this worked is, as the moon advanced over the sun, it was, it was chopping out bits of the sun, right? It was, it was covering it over. 
And if you could coordinate the advance of the moon on the sun, so it's blocking out on the surface, with um, your recording of the radio frequencies, uh, of the strength of radio frequency uh, received, it would tell you what was transmitting strongly and what was transmitting weakly. And he used he used this to tell that uh, the corona was incredibly hot. He had evidence for this, and that a lot of activity that the the really powerful waves he was getting from the surface of the sun were from sunspots. And if it wasn't for him observe, if it wasn't for the fact that where he observed in Ottawa there was an eclipse then, the solar eclipse, he wouldn't have been able to make that observation. That's sort of cool. The two other things are a little more trivial. And one involves a, a lost document that was found again. So the, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, it's founded in 1868 by a handful of people. And uh, one of their big projects in 1869 was to organize a serious eclipse observation program. They did this. Um, and uh, in, in some minor journals, they published the results. Well, 30 or 40 years later, a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the RASC, he sees an, an advertisement for a telescope. And he thinks, oh, I'm interested in this. He's in Toronto. This advertisement is, uh, it was placed by someone who was a little bit outside the city. So this guy, he goes to look at the telescope, see whether he wants to buy it. He goes there. He opens up the telescope case. He's interested in the telescope. Pinned to the top of the telescope case on the inside of the lid was an old blue Victorian document, a document for the 1860s, written in ink, written quite beautifully in ink, but I mean the thing's sort of, you know, rat-eaten, it's got bits missing. What this was, was the first, it's a draft of the regulations of the bylaws first bylaws for the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And there it was, just by chance, in this telescope case. On the back of it, in pencil, were rough observations of that solar eclipse. It's sort of at, at, at the heart of the beginning of the RASC. And that's sort of cool. So this thing, again, was found by chance. The other thing I would mention is, uh, so in the 19th century, I, 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 I did talk earlier about uh, U European powers setting out eclipse ex expeditions. And these, you know, these went around the world, usually following uh, paths that were open through um, colonial administrations. Where It's where European powers' navies were, it's where the, their um, colonial agents were. So it, it provided a way for astronomers to get to those places. Well, in, in Newfoundland, so this is on the extreme east coast of Canada, there was an eclipse, I think it was 1905, and Canada decided that it would show, they so it's, it's a new country, well, relatively new country as a, a, as a united national entity not subject to Britain anymore, or less and less subject to Britain, it would show its seriousness as a country by mounting an, a serious astronomical expedition and it would invite observers from Europe. The Canadian astronomers built all this expensive, complicated equipment. They practiced their observations before the eclipse, because if you've only got a maximum of seven minutes to do your observations, you've got to make sure that what you're doing works really smoothly. They practiced this. They, the Canadian government contributed funds. They carted their instruments you know, out to this observation site in Labrador. They had good documentation happening all the time, so they had... They had people um, photographing the equipment and the progress of the exposition as they went there. They got clouded out. And this happens, of course. So all that effort for nothing, in a way. But what does survive are these fantastic albums, the Eclipse Exposition, showing them gathering their instruments, showing them on various modes of transport, you know, uh, a ship, and, and, and other ways until they got to the location. Um, there are, there's almost an ethnographic document. There's an ethnographic document of the um, European tradition, European trained scientists, and the Canadians fall into this, as well as the people who are not scientists, so the various First Nations groups they meet there. And it, it's valuable that way. So here's a, an eclipse providing an excuse 
in a way, so, so the eclipse itself, that 1905 eclipse observation, that expedition was a failure, but it produced this document which is not a failure. It's a treasure trove of, of, of evidence from the period. I was wondering maybe if we could shift gears a little bit. Um, how would you characterize the relationship between the science of astronomy and indigenous traditions? Oh, that's a great question. Um, certainly not a constant. Uh, if you look at some of the earliest records of interactions between settlers, between Europeans, when they come uh, to the shores here, and, uh, and the First Nations. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. It's not what one would expect. Sure, there were idiots. There's always going to be idiots on the boat with you. But um, I'm struck by... Frequently, the Europeans would treat the First Nations people they met with respect. And they would note, well, these people do X better than we do. Or they have a, a technological way of doing something um, which is really good. And so you get these in things like the Jesuit relations. So the, these are reports the Jesuits compiled and sent back to Europe um, just about how their missions were going. And there's a lot of really interesting there's scientific, uh, there's scientific information in there, there's social information in there. And they would report um, they would report uh, the views of uh, the First Nations about the various uh, a celestial phenomena that they both that the Europeans uh, experienced and and the First Nations people, and it's interesting. You all there. There's very little. There's the ones I was looking at, and they were uh, later 17th century. The ones I can I can remember best. Um, there's none of this. Well, here's what these First Nations people believe. Here's what these Indians believe. And haha, what a joke. They're not scientific. That doesn't happen at this period. They report what the First Nations say, their explanations, their cosmology, and they say, that's interesting. It's not what we believe, but this is worth reporting. You get to the 18th century, things, I mean, there's still that attitude, but things start to change. But it's really in the 19th century that you get this sort of, oh, I don't know the right term for it. I'll call it European cultural or, yeah, I mean, European, or, European or Western cultural attitude of superiority compared to people who are not part of that group. Well, we have modern science. We have modern technology. These people don't. Here's what they think. Aren't they ignorant? Find that in the 19th century and into the 20th century. While things seem to be coming around again present period, um, perhaps spurred by things such as, well, many things, but um, people realizing that uh, you know, in some of the communities, that we have to come to terms with the colonial past if we want to, if we want to make a success of the way we're living now, we have to come to terms with that, and we have to take the bad things we did in the past seriously, and work with uh, the communities who were here long before we were. That means taking their cosmology seriously. So, what, now well, the other thing I should say is, when I speak about this stuff, I am not a First Nations person. I'm an, an old white guy. So, anything I say is uh, is worth less than uh, you know about this stuff <laughs> is worth less than someone who's who's a First Nations person. I mean that you know that's a given. That's obvious. So, some of the people in the First Nations communities have come up with an idea of a two-eyed seeing, and There'd be variations of that, but what it is, is you inform yourself, so you learn what Western science has to say about whatever, so about astronomy, and you learn its techniques as much as, as much as you can, and then you also don't throw out your own traditions, but you try to see the world, both those lenses at the same time. The idea is your the insight you will gain is greater than if you were just looking through either a Western lens or a Native lens. But they're both worthwhile, provide, the, both of these ways of seeing things are worthwhile, provided you approach both with mutual uh, respect and understanding. 
And that seems to be catching on in a lot of the astronomical, the scientific astronomical community. I mean, there are other questions you can raise. How, um, how um, are these ways of seeing the world um, commensurate? Can they really be brought together? And that's something that people have to work on. And why should it be easy? But I can think of an analogy that gives some hope of this being useful. There was an important European astrophysicist, uh, Arthur Stanley Eddington. Um, he was based at the uh, University of Cambridge. And he's one of the people, well, speaking of eclipses, he played a major role in the eclipse. I think it was 1919 eclipse. He, that eclipse provided the opportunity for him and his colleagues to do the first real test of whether Einstein's theory of relativity um, actually conformed to observation, and it was an eclipse that provided that. Anyways, uh, a, scho uh, 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 a um, scholar working on Eddington uh, uh, at, at present has talked about Eddington's Quaker beliefs and how those beliefs, a different way of seeing things, enabled him to do astrophysics in a slightly different way from his contemporaries, and that was actually an advantage. So by the same uh, by the same analogy, looking at it, it is possible that looking at a First Nations cosmology may provide a, a, an insight that can be used in modern astrophysics. It's not impossible. So thank you so much for joining us today. You gave us so much great material. We really appreciate oh, it. Oh, well, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Eclipsing History. This podcast was produced by the students of the Public History Program of Bowling Green State University under the direction of Drs. Cheryl Dong and Amilcar Chalou. Landon Cena composed the original music for the podcast, Ohio Humanities provided financial support. To access other episodes and additional content, go to bgsu.edu slash eclipsinghistory.